Good morning, my friend. Dr. Lee Warren here with you, and I am excited and grateful that you're listening here on Self Brain Surgery Saturday. We're going to change our minds about something today, and I want to give you a special guest. Yesterday, I had a chance to talk to somebody that I have revered and thought highly of for 30 years. Dr. Michael Behe is a biochemist from Lehigh University, and back in 1996, he published a book called Darwin's Black Box. The Biochemical Challenge to Evolution. It might surprise you because the, the media and public schools universally promote Darwinian evolution as the fact, as the way that life arose, that species develop and form. But it might surprise you that the actual scientific research out there doesn't support that at all. In fact, since Watson and Crick described the molecular structure of DNA, Darwinian evolution has become more and more and more in question as an origin of life explanation. And you frequently see things when you actually look at the papers that propose to explain how particular things got here, like the retina of the eye or the bacterial flagellum, for example. You see phrases like appeared or developed or arose or came about. You don't see, here's the explanation scientifically of how this happened. There's always this filter in place of, we know it started with evolution. We just can't prove it. So we're going to say it arose. We, we're going to say that it developed. We're going to say that it showed up. But if you actually look at the science, it doesn't say what you think. And it reminds me of that story that Mark Twain was attributed to having said, it ain't what you know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And so a lot of times the things that get us in trouble is that we spend our lives believing or, or following things that turn out not to be so sure, not so certain, not so true. And I just want to give you today an incredible conversation that I had with Dr. Behe yesterday. The book Darwin's Black Box was named by National Review as one of the top 100 most important nonfiction works of the 20th century. Let that sink in. It's never gone out of print since 1996. George Gilder wrote, that Darwin's black box overthrows Darwin at the end of the 20th century in the same way that quantum theory overthrew Newton at the beginning of the 20th century. In May of 2005 in The New Yorker, Alan Orb said, Dr. Behe is the most prominent of the small circle of scientists working on intelligent design, and his arguments are by far the best known. Darwin's black box was important to me because I found it in my residency training when I was in Pittsburgh, and I was surrounded by... A lot of people who were evolutionists, reductionists, atheists, certainly it was a minority position to believe that God created the earth and the nervous system and everything else. And Darwin's black box gave me a a sort of encouragement that real scientists sometimes are believers, that real scientists actually, there are people out there who are still following the scientific method. We had an incredible conversation yesterday. I think it's going to be helpful. And if you're a parent of a child in public schools, or if you have grandchildren who are going to be going to or are in public schools, it might be helpful for you to read Darwin's Black Box, Dr. Behe's work, and just be able to give your kids an alternative way of thinking because evolution is taught to them as the fact. And the truth is, it ain't necessarily so. Now, I want to be careful because this is a common way that evolutionists will attack you if you try to to bring up intelligent design or creationism or any other type of non-evolutionary explanation for life because it's a fact that species do evolve over time. There's no doubt about that. If you take what Darwin looked at, which was before we understood anything about biochemistry or molecules or any of that, Darwin was looking basically at phenotype, at, at the way things look. And he would say, well, if you study this population of finches, for example, over time, the ones that have sharper beaks are more successful in breaking seeds and the other ones die off. And over time, the species starts to look more and more the same, that that the genetics of the particular birds start to favor one another over time in a population or an environment because the ones that aren't at an advantage will die off. And so it is true that the features of a species in a given environment over time tend to promote that process that benefits them becoming more and more popular so that over time the genes start to become more aligned with one another. And that's called survival of the fittest. And that is undoubtedly true. It's absolutely true. But at the same time, that fact that species evolve over time 
is not the same as saying that one species evolved from another, or even if you back it up far enough, that all species arose from a common ancestor or that life became life out of a chemical soup. Like all of that stuff is not actually scientifically validated. And it's now, since we know how DNA works and about the information in the cell and how complex cells are, what we're learning over time actually is that it's looking more and more and more unlikely that life could have arisen without the influence of an intelligent designer. So Darwin's Black Box gives us a look at that. The book has held up remarkably well. It was re-released a few years ago with the new afterward. And it's just a tremendous look at the actual state of the science of evolutionary biology and origin of life. And I think it was a wonderful blessing that I got to talk to Dr. Behe. And I would just highly encourage you to read his books. He's got several books, but Darwin's Black Box is the one that kind of led me to understanding that I wasn't alone and believing that we were created and fearfully and wonderfully made. This will encourage you. And if you find yourself a little bit lost in the science, just understand that the book itself is written from a lay perspective. And if even if you don't know the first thing about biochemistry or molecular biology, Darwin's Black Box will give you a really good handle on what the truth of the state of the science is. He doesn't write it from a religious perspective. He writes it from the perspective of a scientist who's honestly looking at the data. And I think it'll be very helpful to you. But before we get into Darwin's Black Box, I have a question for you. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. Are you ready to change your life? Well, this is the place, Self Brain Surgery School. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and this is where we go deep into how we're wired, take control of our thinking, and find real hope. This is where we learn to become healthier, feel better, and be happier. This is where we leave the past behind and transform our minds. This is where we start today. Are you ready? This is your podcast. This is your place. This is your time, my friend. Let's get after it. Friend, we're back, and I'm so excited to introduce a new friend to you today. I've read his book for many years, and I've talked to you about him on the show several times before. We've got Dr. Michael Behe with us here today. Welcome to the show, Mike. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Warren. It's great to be with you. It's so um, grateful to have you here. I, I don't think I've told you this yet, but your book hit me in my personal life at a really important time. I was a neurosurgery resident in Pittsburgh in the late 90s and had gone through biochemistry training as my undergraduate degree. And, and it was just refreshing to find a, a person who was writing a book that could sort of help a young Christian scientist not feel so alone. And your, your book really meant a lot to me way back yeah. then. So thank you for writing it. Yeah, that's terrific. Uh, it's one, wonderful. It, it's uh, in, in retrospect, everything is so obvious. It's, it's astounding to me that people have trouble seeing it. Yeah. Well, give us a high level, uh, you know, kind of a high level overview of your life and your work, and then we'll get into the details of Darwin's black box and go from there. Sure, sure. I'm a biochemist. I went to college at Drexel University in Philadelphia and University of Pennsylvania, also in Philadelphia. Studied biochemistry, which is the study of the molecular basis of life. And I was just interested in science uh, my whole life, as yeah. many uh, guys are. And I um, did a postdoctoral studies at the National Institutes of Health. I worked on sickle cell hemoglobin in graduate school and in DNA structure and um, in uh, postdoc. And uh, so I didn't have any particular views in mind about evolution. I, I, I didn't think about evolution in my younger days. Right. I just wanted to be a scientist, a regular um, uh, professor, and I eventually got a job at Lehigh University, and I was plugging along doing regular stuff. But then I uh, kind of serendipitously read a book, Skeptical of Evolution, and uh, that kind of made me curious because I had never heard anybody express skepticism about evolution in my studies. And here I was a, a tenured associate professor at a, at a good school. And so I looked into it and I eventually uh, came to the conclusion that m most of the uh, received view was incorrect and that 
Uh, we, uh, we need to uh, recognize that much of life was purposely designed. And since that time, I've spent the bulk of my, my time defending that view because it, it has turned out to be pretty controversial. I, I didn't realize that going in, but <laughs> turns out that way. Wow. Now, were you a Christian already at that time, or did you come to faith later? Or what was your, your experience with faith along that way? No, I, I'm, uh, I've been a Christian my whole life. I'm a Roman Catholic. I was born into a Catholic family. My parents were practicing uh, Catholics. I went to parochial school. Uh, but uh, I, in Roman Catholicism and, I guess, other um, uh, uh, other Christian denominations, uh, one can view evolution as sort of a the- in a theistic fashion that, yeah. well, maybe God set the universe up to unfold and, you know, he, he uh, made the laws and so on. And so even if uh, things unfolded the way that uh, many scientists think, that is apparently random things, God foresaw that and, and, uh, uh, so it's not a challenge to that view uh, of creation. Yeah, that seemed just fine to me. I, I didn't care, you know, what the heck. I, I was interested in, yeah. in other things. And I was I was taught in parochial school that Darwin's theory was our best guess at how life unfolded. So it was not for religious reasons that I started to question Darwin's the theory it was purely for scientific reasons. I, I read a book from a scientist, a geneticist in Australia by the name of Michael Denton. Yeah. And uh, he set me on the path to skepticism. So, uh, yeah, I've been a Christian my whole life, but that played a surprisingly small role in my skepticism about Darwin. Well, I think it's important to, to just parse that out a little bit because I think the those of us who are drawn to science, we either have, we either find ourselves kind of not thinking about the whole evolution situation, sort of believing in God and and believing in science, and then sort of having this cognitive dissonance about how the two fit together. And I think that's important for parents too. If anybody's listening out there with parent with kids or grandkids, and you don't know what to think about school and the things that were taught and, and all of that. But I think it's also important because I got all the way to neurosurgery training, Mike, and, and, you know, spent all these years working in biochemistry labs with, with everybody else, basically in my world being Darwinian evolutionary biologists. And I always was sort of the kid in the room that was weird, you know, that, that went to church and, and it felt differently. So it was interesting to me when I started reading your book back in the nineties, like, wait a minute, like the, the things that the scientists teach us and the things that the school books teach us aren't really scientifically validated. They're not really proven the way that science ought to work. So maybe just start there and talk to us a little bit about about science and worldview and some of the things that led you into, into questioning evolution in the first place. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, it's interesting. Um, growing up, I never thought there was such a thing as worldview and just what people told me, you know, uh, what you're taught in school. I always took my teacher's word for it. I mean, right. I was just a kid, you know, what, <laughs> what do I know? And even as yourself being trained in science and even graduate school and further, uh, everybody just assumed that evolution was correct. And, it, and it was, uh, uh, it could explain everything we found out about life. Uh, and it's surprising how those background assumptions can really defeat any critical thinking, even in people who have the ability to know better. I, I've written a couple times about a conversation I had with a fellow postdoc uh, at the National Institutes of Health back in the 1980s. Uh, she's uh, deceased about 20 years or so ago now, but we were. She was a fellow Catholic. Uh, her brother was a priest, and we were talking about the origin of life. And we said, you know, what would it take to make the first cell? Well, she, well of course, you need DNA. You would say, yeah, yeah. Well, but you, you'd also need, you know, proteins, of course, and you, you need a, certainly a membrane and metabolism and. And we kind of looked at each other and, and stared and said, nah, <laughs> can't happen. But 
then what did we do? We laughed and we kind of turned around and continued with our business. And we figured that, well, if we didn't know, well, somebody must know or somebody will figure it out soon or eventually or something. So just from the background assumption that somebody knows how this happened, even if you scratch your head and said, I, gee, I don't see what's going on here, you don't take it any further. And right. it wasn't, I, I think I mentioned this, this book called Evolution, A Theory and Crisis by a guy named Michael Denton. That was kind of a critical read for me back in the mid-1980s. Um, that he was, as I said, a geneticist. He was. He said he was an agnostic. He didn't care uh, about higher implications. He was just mad that he was being constantly told that Darwin's theory explains all this stuff when he had uh, many, many, many problems. He saw many problems for it. Um, so... Uh, uh, but it's it's interesting for viewers to know when you think about it now, everybody accepts evolution. But back in the day when it was first proposed by Charles Darwin, nobody knew what the foundation of life was. That's right. Yeah, Darwin was talking about you know birds and reptiles and and plants and so on, and features but, of them, the way they looked. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, when this this arm was bigger, this one was shorter, and you know, uh, transformations at kind of the gross, what we'd call the gross anatomical level. Right. Uh, but the cell back then was thought to be just a little piece of jelly, uh, protoplasm. Nobody knew what a cell exact exactly was. Even molecules, we now know molecules are kind of the foundation of matter, certainly in life. But nobody was sure if molecules actually existed. They were kind of theoretical entities. So the point is that people were actually clueless about what the foundation of life was. And so they speculated at these higher levels. It's kind of like you know, looking at a computer and not knowing what a computer is and saying, well, it's kind of got this keyboard, you know, this typewriter over here has a keyboard too. Right. Maybe somehow they have something to do with it. <laughs> and the, the, as science progressed, and especially since the 19, early 1950s, uh, it's been discovered that the foundation of life, the cell, is, is astoundingly sophisticated and uh, complex. That's right. And... Um, that what we took to be pretty simple processes have, have turned out to be very, very uh, involved. Um, and I detail a lot of them in, in my writings, but just for the, in case anybody in the audience hasn't heard of it yet, the, the cell is run literally by machines. Yeah. Ma machines made out of molecules. And I, I guess the most famous one that uh, is kind of a paradigm of intelligent design is uh, something called the bacterial flagellum, which is literally an outboard motor that bacteria use to swim. And it's got all sorts of mechanical parts it's got a propeller and a motor, and it's got clamps to hold it in place, and it's got regulatory apparatuses, and it's a real machine. It's a nano machine. And trying to envision how something like that could come about step by step in a gradual Darwinian process as, as uh, we're taught in school is enormously difficult. Um, and even more surprising to me when I first became skeptical of this stuff back when I read that book, uh, Evolution of Theory and Crisis in the 80s, when I first read that, I said, well, yeah, you know, we, when you study biochemistry, you see all of these sophisticated systems. And I had all I often wondered, you know, how, how in the world did that evolve? But I figured somebody else knew, so I yeah. didn't bother with it. <laughs> But then, after reading that book, I said, well, who, who has explained this stuff? Because Denton said, you know, a lot of things were big problems. And so I went into the science library and looked in the journals where people would have published papers explaining how this 
machine developed step by step by this pre from this precursor. And here was the selective effect, and this is the intermediates it would have gone through. through. And I was astounded to find that there were no such papers. And I don't mean a small amount of them. I mean no papers, uh, except, you know, at the broadest speculative level. Right. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing that this is really a, a one of the kind of pillars of modern thinking, and yet the... Uh, evidence behind it is is virtually nil. Yeah, it's amazing to me, and I think there's a there's something we need to parse out here because the the listener will be aware that people say, well, evolution has absolutely been proven, but we have a conflated terminology there because there are some things that are definitely true over time. Like some species that live in certain similar environments will start to maybe on a DNA level select out things that if you look at them just in the lab, they, they do share similar DNA sequences and they do share similar sure. things that they create because they have similar purposes. And I always thought of that as God doesn't need to build the same tool twice. If he's going to do a particular thing in nature, he might make it the same way in multiple different species. But there's something called conversion evolution that, you know, I published a paper in the PNAS in the 90s that we, we were doing research about ankylosing spondylitis, and, and our paper in the PNAS has a sub title about convergent evolution. And when we wrote that, the other authors of the paper all thought that that was a term that reinforced Darwin. And in my worldview, it was just a term that explained how two bacteria ended up with similar protein structures because they do the same job, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be careful because as, as you said, evolution is this very flexible word. word. Right. And People use it in different senses, and they kind of slide between different senses. And um, so, uh, in general, there are three major uh, senses in the idea of evolution. The, f the first is common descent. That is the notion that, well, creatures today, living today, are descended by birth and death from creatures that lived in the in the misty past. Right. And you know, that's an interesting idea, but in, in my own view, that's that's kind of trivial because it it doesn't say where those creatures in the past came from. It doesn't say how they may have transformed into creatures today. It just says, well, they were there and now these thing these different things are here. So, it, it, okay, it might be an interesting uh, statement about natural history, but in a sense, it's trivial. Yeah. The, se the second aspect of evolution that people kind of uh, mean is natural selection. And right. that is, that was proposed by Darwin. He says, well, you know, out in the wild, you know, some organisms, if they have a variation, maybe some members of a species are a little bigger than others or faster than others or brighter in color or something like that. May, that might give them an edge in the struggle to survive. Right. And so over time, they would have more offspring and take over the population. And again, in my view, that's interesting, but again, it's trivial because who's going to dispute that if you have an advantage that, that you're likely to do better than somebody else. Right. Well, that's kind of uh, kind of a tautology even. But the third sense is is the big one. That's the one that people pay the least attention to, but that's where all the importance is. And that is the contention that random variation or random mutation in our our uh, more modern language just random changes, accidental changes in DNA or the constitution of the organism will provide the fodder for natural selection to build these fantastically complex structures that have been discovered in life, and not only at the whole organism level, but at the molecular level as well. And, and for my two cents, that is where pretty much 99.9% .9 of the claim about evolution, that the importance of it, is invested in that claim of random mutation. 
and that's the one that has you know zero evidence supporting it. That's right. That if you if you ask for evidence of that, you you that's when I did my search back decades ago and found that there were no papers in the science literature. And since then, I've kept plugging away. And, and in fact, you find quite the opposite, that you find that most changes that are helpful to organisms and are selected turn out to be ones that break or degrade pre-existing systems. That's you right. don't see any evidence of new sophisticated uh, machinery, such as that which fills the cell. You, you don't see that being built by uh, an evolutionary Darwinian process. That's right. You know, I think it's it's fascinating to me, and I, it's interesting because I think it's how God works. Like when you start searching for truth in any discipline, I think truth always leads. All the roads in investigating truth lead to the same place, and we're seeing it with with the cosmologists and the quantum physicists and the molecular biologists, the evolutionary biologists. Yeah. All these people are discovering. Hey, wait a minute! The, the further we look into, the further we get the ability to look deeper into the system we find it's more and more and more complex. I think the, yeah. the reductionists, I think they all thought, okay, now we have DNA. Now we're going to be able to explain exactly how this all happened. And But the truth is, when we learn something new, it just raises more questions, right? And so if we back up all the way, like you said, take all these Darwinian processes and the things that we can demonstrate that are true, survival advantages and whatnot, we still can't ever back up to a place where chemistry turns into biology, like we never we never can explain origin of life. I don't know if it was you or Stephen Meyer that said survival doesn't explain arrival, but that's a great little line. Yeah, that that's right. Yeah, that's a, a, a wonderful point that back in the day, back in Darwin's day, um, not only was biology obscure because it didn't know much about the cell, but neither, neither was physics and astronomy and and things like that and it's been the very progress of science not only in biology but in chemistry and physics that has pointed to a a, a very finely tuned uh very elegant universe yeah. uh, uh that uh points strongly to purpose and design and you know on to god of course um yeah, it, it's important to remember that back then, in the 19th century, most physicists thought that the universe was eternal yeah. and unchanging and pretty simple. And most Darwinists uh, thought that life would be pretty common on other planets. Yeah. They thought that Mars would have life and maybe Venus, too, and 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 other things. And, and people even wrote books. I've forgotten the name. A, a fellow famously wrote about canals on Mars and yeah. thought that they were. And he believed in life on Mars because he thought Darwinian processes would uh, occur there. And he thought that, heck, if, if life occurs on Earth, you know, it'd probably occur on Mars too. And since then, um, science has discovered that no, the universe isn't eternal. The universe yeah. had a beginning, and that had you know very strong religious implications. You know what could bring a universe into being other than something outside of the universe? And it's interesting. Um, back in the 1980s, I, I have a slide of this in <laughs> in my deck. There was an editorial in the journal Nature, which is of course the leading science journal in the world yeah. and the the editorial had the had the headline down with the big bang <laughs> <laughs> and, you know down with the big bang in a science journal because he said they said that the big bang gives creationists aid and comfort because it points to a beginning of the universe yeah <laughs> so it's been a remarkable Consilience, bringing together of all sorts of branches of science, biology, astronomy, physics, chemistry, geology, you know, the, the place of the earth, the, the kind of privileged place the earth occupies in the cosmos, the, the many wonderful things that allow 
earth to have water and the water to be a a um, an effective solvent for for living systems and uh, many many other um, features that people didn't think about back a yeah. uh, hundred years ago. Uh, so I, I like to point out that the very progress of science has been pointing insistently beyond the universe for an explanation. It's it doesn't explain itself as many scientists such as Darwin and and other folks have tried to to say, but rather the it it just more and more and the more you know about science the more strongly it supports a uh the view that you know something outside the universe god is behind it that's right i love how you broke down when you looked at that scientific literature that was out and i think it would still hold true today if you pay attention to what school textbooks say and what even published papers say they use words like this feature arrived this this feature appeared about however many million years ago it, it showed up it developed but never yeah. how it arrived or appeared yeah. and so they it feels from an outside perspective if you're just reading it objectively it feels like they decided on the answer and they're trying to make all of the discoveries fit their principle, regardless of what the data suggests, which is kind of the anti-scientific approach, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it certainly is. And if you look into it um, and think about it for a while, it, it, it should make you mad that yeah. school, school kids are being taught stuff that professional scientists know to be false. Yeah. And that is that we know how these structures might have arisen uh, in some naturalistic uh, way. So even Origin of Life, if you look at textbooks for high school students that mention it, they'll say, oh, you know, there was this primordial soup or right. maybe this happened. And they give, they intentionally give the students the impression that we're almost there at explaining the origin of life. Right. And if you look in professional journals, why, you know, just a month or so ago, uh, an article was written by two origin of life professionals who are no sympathizers with with theism or intelligent design that essentially said, we haven't a clue how life started and we should, you know, toss around more different ideas. So the point is that the textbooks intentionally give kids the wrong idea, I think because they want to just say that, well, science can explain it all for you, and right. we should all assume that you know naturalism is true. Yeah. I don't know why, but, but it, it's certainly the case. That's exactly right. And we have this conflation, too, of people who are scientists— I put quotes around that if you're watching. Um, scientists have a media credibility where when a scientist, somebody like Carl Sagan or Francis Crick, says something, then it's given this weight and credibility as if it's been proven to be true. But if somebody who's a Christian, who's also a scientist, says something, then the burden of proof falls on you, right? So like, uh, here's a quote I'm, I'll read you from Francis Crick. I'm sure you've heard. You know, My work as a neurosurgeon, I'm very interested in the issues around mind and brain and the dualism there and is the mind separate from the brain is the brain create what we think of as mind and francis crick who discovered you know was one of the ones who discovered the molecular structure of dna said you your joys and your sorrows your memories and your ambitions your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules you are nothing but a pack of neurons and so here's francis crick saying that mind is just a derivative of brain and that's basically gospel once he says something like that because he's a scientist but i think we yeah. have to we have to recognize that there's statements that are made by scientists but they're not necessarily scientific statements right exactly they they are philosophical they say that the only thing that exists are this is the stuff that we study you know, so we're scientists, we study matter, we study nerves and so on. Therefore, mind doesn't exist. It's, right. it's, only, it's only nerves and connections between nerves and, and so on. But 
that of course is you know big begs the question. Yeah. Another another convenient um, result of that is that it it makes scientists really very important too. That's right. If, after all, if they if they can explain everything, why then they are they are the high priests of society and philosophers and theologians and uh, let alone clergy and uh, they can just be safely. Uh, safely ignored, but it, it's right. really astounding. Astounding if you read Crick's introduction um, uh, that you just quoted and stuff, you'd think that he he got that from some some experiment or right. other. <laughs> but it's just that he he's saying, well, you know, there are nerves, and I don't believe in anything else, so this must be true. It's a deduction. It's not a discovery. It's a deduction from materialistic principles. It's a self-defeating argument as well, because <laughs> if you believe yeah. that you have no free will because everything you think is just a product of the firing of a neuron, then what yeah. would the purpose be in writing a book to convince somebody that they didn't have free will? <laughs> yeah, is, it, so. that's a, a wonderful point. There, there's a man named Philip Johnson who was active in the intelligent design movement, and he died a few years ago. And uh, But he said, you know, think how silly it would be if Francis Crick had written, you know, uh, you know, I am just my nerves, and I am just <laughs> I am just a pack of neurons. <laughs> so who would listen to you know a person That's like right. that? Why should we listen to a pack of neurons? <laughs> but he said you are just a pack of neurons. Said, yeah, that's Stephen right. Stephen Hawking did the same thing. He said everything. Science will explain everything eventually. There's no role for theology, no role for philosophy. It's all science. But that's obviously a philosophical argument and not a scientific one. It's uh-huh. interesting to me. You, you, you mentioned the the phrase intelligent design and just in case somebody is unaware of what that means to talk about the the philosophy and the science of intelligent design for a moment okay well intelligent design it's it's a phrase that uh but it means something that we do every day it's it's you know a question you know can you tell that something has been purposely arranged or is the result of intelligent activity versus uh versus just other unintelligent forces and if you're walking down the street, you might look you know, to the left and there might be, you know, some dandelions growing on somebody's lawn and, you, you know, a few weeds over here. And you look to the right and by the mailbox, there's this nice arrangement of flowers growing out. You know that the one was purposely planted and the other is not because yeah. it's been arranged by the, you know, to beautify the, the, that particular area of the of the. Um, ground. So uh, the question is, how do we recognize that? We all know that there are intelligences. We ourselves have intelligence. Uh, intelligence. We recognize that other things are intelligent. How do we know that? You know, we do it all the time, but but how do we know it? And it turns out the key to recognizing something as the result of intelligent activity is just that. If we see that parts have been arranged for some purpose, because only intelligent beings have purposes. Yeah. Nature, unintelligent nature, doesn't have a purpose. It just does stuff. So if we see like a machine, uh, I, I use an example of a mouse trap in my book, Darwin's Black Box. And if you just think of something like that, anybody who saw that would quickly say, oh, well, that, that was that's purposely designed. And why? Is it a religious conclusion that you say it's purposely? No, because you see the purpose. You see the the spring there and the, the part that will smack the mouse and the board that everything is arranged on. So we, whenever we see a purposeful arrangement of parts, we conclude that it was designed. It is yeah. the result of intelligent activity. And... We have discovered such things in the cell and in life in general, uh, but in, in you know, uh, in particular, we've we've discovered molecular machines like that bacterial flagellum I talked about. It's now literally an outboard motor. Yeah. And, you know, it's more sophisticated than say a mouse trap. So the conclusion of intelligent design is that we can conclude that those things were purposely designed because we see the purpose in the arrangement 
That's how we determine uh, something was designed. Now, of course, uh, Darwin and his uh, his uh, followers later said that, well, no, we can explain it otherwise as the result of random changes and selection. But if you look in the literature, that that's all brag, no fact. You know, they yeah. they can't, and and it's quite the opposite as I've uh, written about. But the point is that intelligent design is not some fluffy philosophical or theological idea. It's, it's just looking at something and seeing that uh, parts have been arranged, and, and it's a something we do every day. And now, when we have the ability to look at, at things in biology up close and the molecular level and so on, we see exactly that. Purpose suffuses uh, the cell. And, and so... The argument of intelligent design here is that we should not ignore our uh, our uh, the conclusion there simply because we prefer some other explanation. Explanation. Yeah, that's exactly right. And in the in the years since you first published Darwin's Black Box, it's just, this book has been in print for almost thirty years. It's a remarkable yeah. book. You've had what several editions published now. Tremendous book. The audiobook's outstanding as well. And I think in the years since that's been published, what's happened on the scientific side in terms of origin of life research and, and Darwinian evolutionary research and, and intelligent design research? And where do we stand now? Like if you if you had an honest, unbiased observer who looked at the world's literature in biology, what would reasonable conclusions be now as to how we all got here? Well, uh, you're asking a, a biased observer to say what the unbiased <laughs> observer would say. We're back with Crick. But, but let me just say this, this about that, that, yeah, coming up on 30 years, and I talked about a number of systems in Darwin's Black Box, blood clotting, the bacterial flagellum, yeah. intracellular transport, a bunch of other things, and... People hated that book. A yeah. lot of Darwinists <laughs> simply despised it, including a lot of really, really smart scientists. And they were highly motivated to show that it was correct. And yet, in the 30 years since then, even though in general science, in particular biology, has progressed by leaps and bounds in figuring out how things work, nobody has been able to explain how any of those things might have arisen through a Darwinian process. That's right. People have described in better detail how they work, and we've seen that they are more sophisticated, but nobody has published anything. And, and you can look in the literature, I and mean, you can do a literature search, look for, you know, how the bacterial flagellum might have arisen. You'll say, well, you'll see just uh, papers that say, well, here, this thing looked like this thing here, or yeah. that thing looked like that thing there. And, and, uh, but you'll, you won't see, you know, how this could have given risen even to something closely related to it. That's right. So, uh, one conclusion is that I stand by everything. And I, I wrote 30 years ago, and the situation has gotten much worse for Darwin's theory in the meantime. Uh, I wrote a book five ish five or so years ago called Darwin Devolves. Yeah. And the gist of that is that in fact, now that we can look at DNA much more closely, we have the ability to sequence it and follow mutations at the molecular level very closely, which we didn't have even 20 years ago. You can see that the uh, the adaptations of organisms that people point to as examples of how evolution might work, like dog breeds, new dog breeds, and things like polar bears being derived from brown bears and, and other such things, they do have mutations that do adapt them to different uh, environments. But they're almost all by degrading genes that already existed in the ancestor organisms. Yeah. So they are devolving rather than evolving. Wow. You know, it's interesting that 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 can help them fit 
better with a particular niche, but it, the long and the short is that they are losing abilities rather than gaining abilities. Wow. Yeah. I mean, if you just think of dog breeds, you, you think of, you know, dachshunds. Well, it turns out that what makes a dachshund, or part of it, is that the gene for a growth factor that allows a dog to grow bigger is broken in small dogs. And in some larger, highly muscled dogs, a controlling element that stops growth when it's gotten to be the proportionate size is broken. Yeah. In dogs with curly hair, a gene in, uh, in hair development is broken. Wow. And, it, it, and these things, uh, dog breeds have been touted by evolutionists for a while as showing the great variety that you can get from an ancestor. And, and that's true. But it turns out it's, it's all due to loss of function, not, not gain of function. Wow. That's really fascinating. I think it's 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 really probably important to tell people who haven't read Darwin's Black Box that you you very carefully lay out this book as not a religious approach to looking at Darwin and science. Like you basically, and I think that's the thing across the board about the intelligent design movement that I've been impressed by is it is not a religious attack on Darwinism or religious attack on chemical or biological evolution. It's looking at actually what do we know from a scientific perspective. If we, if we say the scientific method is ask a question, develop a hypothesis, test it, revise it, and come to the right conclusion based on the data, then you can't get to Darwinian evolution from the data. You just can't. Right. And that's, a, that's a exact, exactly right. It, it's not an attack on science. It's kind of Going back to science, it turns out that Darwin's theory and the subsequent sociological development of it in the scientific community was, in fact, a you know a, a deriving of conclusions from a non-scientific uh, presupposition. That is that uh, that there is nothing that could affect life out, outside of life, and if we rule that out, then something like Darwinism has to be true. But it ruling that out is a philosophical move. It's it's not a scientific one. And if you look again at the evidence and uh, and ask yourself what does it show, it does not show the transformations that Darwinists say must happen. That's right. and, and as science progresses more and more, we see more and more intricacy, more and more elegance at deeper and deeper levels of life. It's not getting more uh, squishy. It's not, it's not getting more uh, simple as you go down to lower levels of life as Darwin and his contemporaries thought. That was the importance of thinking that the cell was just a glob of protoplasm, some piece of jelly. Because even though you could then think that even though at the whole organism level things look kind of complicated, when you got lower it was pretty simple. The opposite has turned out to be the case, that the more we know, uh, when you go to lower levels, the cellular and molecular levels of life, things become more complex, not not less complex. So, uh, yeah, this is where the data lead. Uh, when you do away with the presuppositions of what we're supposed to find, the data points strongly to to intelligent design. So what would you say from a, the standpoint of people listening out there who may be raising kids or, or having grandkids who are in public education or getting ready to be in public education, what would you say to them would be a good approach for what we can do to prepare or arm our children to have a, a, a perspective on this that might be more consistent with the Christian worldview? Yeah, well, I, I guess the, the best thing is just to forewarn them, it, tell them what they can expect, and tell them, you know, in simply uh, age-appropriate way what, what the problems are. You know, when you start out with, say, a mousetrap, you can easily show a little, little a child a mousetrap and say, 
here's you know here's how we know somebody made this somebody did this on purpose and you can't put this together randomly and you have to then explain that you know we live in a world that where a lot of people are anti-god they don't want god to exist they don't want god to have acted in the world and so you have to warn them saying that you know sometimes the things you'll hear in school are influenced by folks with this this um, point of view and and yet it doesn't it doesn't work. It doesn't fit with the mousetrap. It doesn't fit with your hands and fingers and how marvelous they are and, and how they work. So you should be respectful to your teachers. You should, you know, read over what they tell you to read and stuff. But but you have to realize we live in a fallen world. And so people we talk to sometimes will give us wrong information. That's right. Well, Something like that. I love it. So if we have two choices in front of us as we, as we land this plane here today, we have two choices. We're the products of random events from billions of years ago that, that have led us to this place and these lives that we have that may all be just the product of cellular activity. And there's an empty void that we're going to go to after we die. Or there's purpose and meaning in our lives that were designed for a particular purpose and we're exactly where we were supposed to be. Like between those two extremes, after your long and storied career in science, like where do you land and how can people find hope in the work that you've done? Oh, well, you know, just as almost everybody in the entire world thought up until Darwin and even mostly afterwards, the world is filled with purpose, and everywhere yeah. we look, uh, you can you can see it. You can see it, of course, in nature. Everybody loves nature. You go out for a walk in the lovely woods, and then the sunshine and the beautiful you know, weather you can have sometimes, and you can see it in your hands. You don't have to be a scientist. You say, holy moly, look how my hands work, and I can see yeah. stuff. And And this doesn't happen by chance. Everybody in the world knew that, you know, the world was not self-explaining, that somebody created it. And uh, Christianity, of course, uh, talk, you know, knows that God created it and, and so on. But everybody knew that life was created. And um, that's certainly what I understand. And it's been a real tragedy of modern times that we have allowed ourselves to be talked out of this by slick folks in lab coats yeah. <laughs> saying, no, 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 you're just a bag of neurons. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> and that's, that's terrible because, you know, it, it leads to despair for many people. Uh, you know, it might make some people feel self-important, like the scientists who push this line of thinking, but it's a tragedy for almost everybody else. And it's, utterly against uh, utterly against the facts so um, here we are though and nonetheless you can educate yourself you can educate your kids and whoever else will listen to you just by by reading and and seeing that yeah your intuitions your what you see in the world it's true it, it's really true that's the best scientific explanation for how we got here let alone uh, without even touching philosophy and, and theology. Wow. Beautiful. I've been looking forward to this conversation, Mike. You've done a great career's worth of work in helping people sort of parse out what's real and what's just media spin. And I appreciate your time so well, so, so much. And thank you very much for the work that you've done and, and your time here on the podcast this morning. Absolutely. Thanks very much for having me. I've, I've greatly enjoyed our conversation. What a treasure, what a treat, what an honor to have a chance to talk to Dr. Behe. Listen, I can't encourage you highly enough to read Darwin's Black Box and his other book, Darwin Devolves. This is a look at the truth of the state of the science. And again, if you're not a believer, you don't have to be a believer to approach science as a scientist. And what what is science? Well, science is the idea that you look at something and try to explain it 
And then you ask questions of it and devise experiments to test it. And if the experiments don't validate the assumption that you made, then you change the assumption. But the problem with Darwinian evolution is that they decided, and by they, I mean the materialists, the, the, the scientists who, along with Darwin, believed from the start that everything needed to be explainable through natural processes. That's what naturalism, by the way, is. They said, we don't believe in a God or an external creator, and you have to explain everything from a scientific point of view. Science can explain everything. Science is more important than theology or philosophy or any other type of learning. It's the only thing that really counts. That, understand that, is a philosophical position, and that's where they started with evolutionary biology. They started with the premise that we know that there's no supernatural, there's no God, there's no creator, so how do we explain what we see if we, since we know that there's no supernatural, right? which is a terribly unscientific position. My, my teaching to you all the time, my conversation with you is science is a process of asking questions, designing experiments to answer those questions and revising the questions based on the results that we get, not to continue to hold up the, the answer that we started with and make the data fit the answer. We see that with all kinds of things, climate science and other things, where the decision's already been made of how we're going to proceed. We are going to believe this. We're going to teach it. We're going to enforce it. We're going to make laws about it. We're going to make businesses around it. And if the data doesn't support it, then we ignore the data or we attack the scientists who are promoting the data. And that's just not scientific, okay? So what I really appreciate with Dr. Behe is, and whether you believe in God or not, whether you believe in anything related to creationism or any of that, what I appreciate about Dr. Behe is he was a real scientist who looked at the data and said, wait a minute, we've got a problem with the data here. The data don't support the ability of complex systems to have arisen by themselves. The data don't support the idea that one species can develop into another. The data just don't support it. So what else could? And that's what led to the theory of intelligent design. Like basically, if you, as he said in the interview, if you see a complex system in the world, a mousetrap, for example, you don't assume that it just sprung into existence from a, from a bunch of parts lying around. But even if it could do that, then the question would be, where did the parts come from? How did those arise? And how were they all perfectly arranged to fit together in a way that would produce that function? Well, that's what's happening inside your cells. And if you're a parent or a grandparent, I would just highly encourage you to arm yourself with this knowledge so you can help your children be prepared for the onslaught of information they're going to receive that points towards this conclusion that has already been made that we arose through unguided accidental processes from nothing. And I just want to tell you that your friend, the scientist here, your friend, the published neuroscientist, and I've got legit chops there, by the way. I have a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I have a paper in the Lancet. I've done the work, too. And so as a real scientist, I'm telling you that there's more to this story than your kids are going to be taught in school. And some of the things that you're taught in school, some of the textbooks, for example, that you read will show things like Java Man or things like transitional forms in the fossils. And we know now that those things were false, that they were not true even when they were published. And yet they still show up in even college textbooks because they support the narrative. So just take a step back, take a chance to read Darwin's Black Box and appreciate that somebody like Michael Behe's out there. And he's not alone, by the way. The voices are getting louder. And the fact is that you have to have more faith now to be an evolutionary biologist than you had to have in the 1950s. You're, you're in a better position, a stronger position if you're arguing from reason and real science than you are if you're holding on to dogma and belief that the tables have turned a little bit and Dr. B. He helps us get that idea in our heads. And I think it was a tremendous conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. And I just want to encourage you that you can't change your life until you change your mind. And maybe you need to change your mind about some of the things that you've been taught. And the good news is my friend, you can start today. Hey, thanks for listening. The Dr. Lee Warren podcast is brought to you by my brand new book, Hope is the First Dose. It's a treatment plan for recovering from trauma, tragedy, and other massive things. It's available everywhere books are sold, and I narrated the audio books. Hey, 
The theme music for the show is Get Up by my friend Tommy Walker, available for free at TommyWalkerMinistries.org. They are supplying worship resources for worshipers all over the world to worship the Most High God. And if you're interested in learning more, check out TommyWalkerMinistries.org. If you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at WLeeWarrenMD.com slash prayer, WLeeWarrenMD.com slash prayer, and go to my website and sign up for the newsletter, Self Brain Surgery, every Sunday since 2014, helping people in all 50 states and 60 plus countries around the world. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'll talk to you soon. Remember, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today.